Welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us in this fourth episode of the series on, on Rent to Own that is being presented by Altair together with the African Union for Housing Finance. My name is Casey Arrest and I'm the Executive Director of the Center for Affordable Housing Finance in Africa. And we are the Secretariat to the African Union for Housing Finance. The AUHF is a member-based body, an industry body, that represents um, 58 members now in 24 countries across the continent. Um, a really good group of technocrats and practitioners working in affordable housing um, and, and an excellent base for, for networking and engagement and learning and sharing. Um, I would like you to, to um, think about and invite you to join, to join the AUHF as a member. We've got a range of membership categories that relate both to institutions as well as individuals. And I'm sure you're all familiar with the fact that we have a conference annually in the fourth quarter of the year. This year, it's going to be at the end of November in Cairo. And we're going to focus on a green urban future for affordable housing. Um, very keen for you to come and join us in Cairo in real life, in person. Um, we hope that the destination is a significant draw card to get you to get on a plane and to come and meet with us. And it really is a wonderful conference, two days of conference, and then a site visit on the third day to an affordable housing development um, for AUHF members. There's also the AGM, and then we also have a masterclass and so on. So really, please do come and join us. Today's session is the fourth in a series um, that has been put together, it was proposed by Altair um, to discuss rent to own. And we've been so encouraged by everyone's engagement and participation. Um, and there's so much interest in this question of rent to own. So the first three sessions, as I mentioned, are, are available online on YouTube. And Tandi Wei, my colleague, the coordinator of the AUHF, has sent out mails with, with those links. Um, but today we're bringing it home. And so Olu is going to present to, to, um, to uh, this audience, um, I suppose, Olu, a, a quick summary of where we've been in the last three sessions, um, and then take forward some lessons from our colleagues who have joined us. And Olu, would you like to take over now and you can introduce the session. While we're carrying on, please record your questions in the chat. Um, and then between Olu and I, we'll field those and do our best to make sure they're all answered. And if they're not answered in the session, then we will um, make sure that we answer them afterwards. And just one last thing to say is thank you to all of you for coming, but also to, to the panelists and to Altair for making this happen. It's such a nice example of what the AUHF wants to do is to foster conversation between people who have experiences in different corners of the affordable housing sector across the continent. So thanks very much. Alu, over to you. Um, good afternoon, all. Um, greetings from Bera, Mozambique, um, not usually my UK base. Um, I welcome you all to come down to Biera to not only visit um, um, Marie's project Casarel, but importantly, the new urban park that, um, as I was talking to the mayor of uh, Biera yesterday, probably the most exciting and innovative urban park in Africa. So when next you're planning your holiday, I encourage you to come to Biera. Um, as um, Kesia mentioned, today's, um, and also apologies for any background noise, I'm actually speaking from one of our client offices um, in the urban park. So uh, um, any background noise will be because um, um, uh, people are working in the, in the park. Um, can I, like um, Kesia, thank you for um, uh, participating in this session. Um, I think there's the fourth of the series. And probably, um, I must say, the most exciting, the most exciting in the sense that we've got actual practitioners, people that have tried to translate the concept of rent to own or lease to own or rent or whatever you want to call it into practice. And it would be an opportunity, I think, to get the best out of it if you can give us your questions because they will be giving you uh, practical insight of the opportunities and the challenges 
of um, um, delivering rent to own. Um, just a quick casting you back to um, why this series was initially initiated by ourselves and through uh, discussions with Kesha. The premise was um, a recognition that mortgage, the mortgage market in, in a lot of um, Africa is underdeveloped. And the reality is that it's not going to be um, expanded in the short to medium term. Um, the also reality in a lot of um, urban settings in Africa is that people are actually renting um, and, and also trying to own properties, albeit informally. And our view, and was supported by a lot of evidence and experience elsewhere, that the most likely product that um, will enable people to own their own homes is either rental or rent to own. And the trick is trying to find a ways in which we can scale it up and scale it up rapidly to respond to the current housing crisis we face. So the past series has been trying to look at the technicalities, the details of how rent to own works. We've looked at the differences between um, what I call payment plans and traditional rent to own, which is more longer term. We've looked at issues about how do you design a product for um, people in middle income to lower income, when does government subsidy required? The institutional framework that is required in terms of the very, various legal entities that needs to be in place, especially when you're trying to attract institutional investment. And, um, and the last um, session explored all the sort of legal challenges that needs to be addressed in trying to set up rent to own, especially practices elsewhere, um, not only in the continent, but abroad as well. So the final session is one about actually getting our panelists that have sought to implement it on the ground to share their experiences and exp um, expertise with yourself. And as I said earlier, the benefit of it will be if it's as more interactive as possible. So without much uh, further ado, our, um, the plan is for the panelists to provide a sort of five minutes introduction, both of themselves and of the project in which they have been involved with. And then we'll then open it up to um, discussions um, and, uh, and also taking questions. And the plan, as usual, is to finish um, within the time allocated. So um, if you if um, if Femi is ready, do I do you mind if I call you to to kick off the the session? Okay, uh, thank you, Olu. Uh, thank you to Kessie and the team at uh, CAHF, and um, also uh, to my fellow panelists, and obviously uh, the audience. Uh, if I may, Olu, I'd like to share a screen, uh, if I can, uh, just to perhaps um, uh, talk through my uh, my slide. Well, that is not happening. So if you just give me a minute, um, I will try to do that. Just one second. Let me bring this up. Okay, that's fine. Okay, um, thank you. I think, let, let me just start a quick introduction. My name is uh, Femi Adewale. I'm the Managing Director at the Family Homes Funds Limited. Um, the Family Homes Funds Limited is a, um, is a large scale house, social housing agency, uh, which was created by the federal government of Nigeria in partnership with the Nigerian Sovereign Investment Authority uh, to provide financing for public and private sector developers 
uh, who are promoting housing that is affordable to Nigerians on low income. Uh, the fund has been actively operational for um, about three years, and today has invested just under 100 billion naira in um, in providing about 38,000 homes across various states in Nigeria. So that's what I do. But and one of the key aspects of the work that the Family Homes Fund has to do in delivering on its mission uh, is ensuring that when homes are built, that real people actually have access to them. Uh, but the Family Homes Fund is not uh, the first organization to try uh, to solve this conundrum in Nigeria, and I dare say Sub-Saharan Africa's housing market. Uh, there was a precursor to that about eight years ago, a similar organization called the Lagos Choice Limited Partnership uh, was formed uh, between as a partnership between the Lagos State Government and a private sector developer uh, to solve a very similar problem that the Family Homes Fund um, is trying to solve today. And the presentation that I wish to make draws largely uh, on the experience of the Lagos choice um, uh, in trying to address the demand side of the housing market and coming up with a lease purchase uh, scheme, uh, which is aimed at enabling uh, access uh, to Lagosians on middle income uh, to, um, uh, to affordable housing. Uh, it is a model that the Family Homes Fund itself is now looking at. It hasn't yet implemented this, but I think that for the purposes of, um, of this uh, discussion, um, it's perhaps useful to draw on the Lagos Choice uh, experience and the nuances um, of that product that was developed. So in presenting that product, I will basically be looking at two key issues around it. Uh, one is the financing of the lease purchase um, uh, program in Lagos. And the second uh, is the organization uh, of the lease purchase program. So as I said, uh, the Lagos Choice LP uh, is a limited partnership between the Lagos state government and the private sector developer and the specific purpose uh, was to provide about 10,000 affordable housing units on a lease uh, purchase basis. Uh, some key information about the project, um, home ownership uh, through the shared equity or lease purchase programs was a primary feature of the project. Uh, the second key feature of the project was to develop a savings culture and uh, the design of the uh, lease purchase program included uh, setting up what was called choice clubs, which were basically housing savings um, clubs. And then there were other impact objectives, such as an apprenticeship program, uh, innovations in sustainable design, uh, the target market was the low to upper middle income earners, and the product range were typically two and three bedroom apartments and three bedroom single family units. Uh, the product price range were between 5 million and 25 million Nigerian Naira. I think if you divide that by uh, 700 today, it will give you the dollar equivalent. So in terms of the structure of that lease purchase program itself. Just some big highlights. Um, essentially, the scheme was to give um, buyers an opportunity to acquire their home in stages, which were known as staircasing, on a lease purchase basis over a 15 year uh, period. So in terms of uh, illustration, assuming a home was worth 5 million naira, uh, the arrangement was that buyers were encouraged to buy a minimum initial equity in the home of 20%. That means that they're able to move into their home for as little as 1 million naira, which was within 
the range of the target markets. Um, the program gives them up to two years to save up for this initial equity. And the balance 80% of that equity, which is called the retained equity, was then held by the, by the company, which was the Lagos Choice Limited Partnership. Uh, subsequently, uh, develop, uh, the buyers make monthly lease payments, uh, which were uh, pegged at no more than the typical rent for the same type of accommodation to offset the holding costs of the retained equity. Uh, buyers are then encouraged uh, to buy further equities in their home. So that's the purchase bid in at least 10% tranches over a period of 15 years. So essentially, uh, the, the, the envisaged result was that the scheme allowed uh, buyers uh, to have access to uh, decent home ownership uh, uh, by taking little steps uh, towards full home ownerships, whilst the government has a decent return on its investment from monthly lease payments that were made, but also uh, the capital repayments. And uh, these are just illustrations uh, of some of the initial house types uh, for um, uh, that underpin uh, that, uh, that program. In terms of the financial model, and you have a rather kind of complicated structure here, um, I will just walk through, through this uh, network of uh, bubbles. Um, uh, if you follow my cursor, uh, the operating vehicle was the Lagos Choice LP, which was, uh, as I indicated earlier, was a limited partnership between the Lagos state government and the private sector uh, developers. The idea was that the limited partnership um, acquires completed homes from uh, private sector developers. So some of the units were to be developed by the LP itself or by third party uh, developers, but the LP acquired completed homes, which it then sold uh, to uh, my choice purchaser. So these were individuals who have aggregated themselves into a savings club on a lease purchase basis. Uh, the revenue from the monthly lease payments uh, to uh, obviously goes back to the operating vehicle in addition uh, to uh, the capital receipts uh, uh, from uh, equity buyback uh, from the purchasers all go back. So these two are the key revenue streams into the operating vehicle. Now you have this kind of tangent of, which is the refinancing possibility of the cash flows that go into the operating vehicle. So uh, at maturity or adequate seasoning, uh, both of these two cash flows can be securitized or refinanced to ensure that the LP continues to have a sustainable liquidity uh, to buy further homes and sell them onto purchasers. Now, where does the limited partnership get its money from? Uh, the idea behind the line was to create an investment vehicle um, which was supported by government and provided attraction to investors to put money into uh, the investment vehicle. So, so that was one uh, option. Uh, if you allow me, I'll move to a different iteration of the same structure. Uh, in this structure, uh, rather than depend on investment, the ultimately the state actually chose to create a housing bond um, with revenue feeds in addition to those from the lease purchase program, uh, um, rev additional revenues from rentals from existing public housing portfolio and some subsidy. But again, the idea was that the bond floated on the capital market attracted private, uh, uh, can attract private sector um, uh, investment. 
So that is a kind of global financial model. But I think this begins to make sense uh, when we look at how does it work uh, for the customer? What does the customer side uh, transaction look like? So uh, there again here, a, a bubble flow. Uh, potential members uh, uh, or potential buyers are encouraged as a condition first to join a savings club, which was branded My Choice. And within that club, they commit uh, to making monthly savings towards a 20% uh, equity. Uh, when they achieve uh, the 20% equity savings level, they're they are allocated a home and they can move into their home uh, after having saved 20% initial equity, and that comes on a first come, first served basis. So the first ones to make the 20% equity uh, basically get uh, to uh, the allocations and on like that. So there's a motivation for uh, members of the choice club uh, to actually make uh, savings into their uh, uh, My Choice account. Uh, once they have moved uh, into the home, they start to make monthly lease payments, uh, which was equivalent to 0.75% of the unsold equity. So that's 80% of the value of the property uh, per annum. So that is their monthly uh, lease payment that is made uh, into the LP. Uh, after the initial equity purchase, uh, buyers can buy further equity uh, in minimum tranches of 10%. And this was set at 10%, uh, basically to allow to ease the administrative process of adjusting payments and the My Choice account of the buyers. So uh, when they have achieved a full 100% interest in the home, uh, uh, they own, they now fully obviously own the home. Uh, before then, what they have is a beneficial interest uh, in the property. So basically that is how uh, the customer side transaction work was fairly simple and straightforward. Now, um, how does this compare with the traditional a mortgage. Uh, I've kind of put uh, together a table. This is well dated now. Uh, these were all developed about eight years ago. And um, uh, uh, it tells you what the annual lease payment is at 0.75% of 80% of a 5 million Naira home. Uh, this suggests and is modeled that the first um, uh, equity buyback happens in year five. There's a further one in year seven, in year nine, in year 11, and year 13, and year 15. So what you see is that as the buyer buys more equity, the lease payment uh, drops because the lease payment is pegged to the unsold or unowned equity. But what is showing it on the back of this cash flow is that the total cost uh, to the purchaser um, uh, is just over 50% of the cost compared to a traditional mortgage. This was pegged at the time at 22% and is probably still the case today uh, for commercial mortgages uh, in Nigeria. So it's not only offering access in terms of ease of cash flow, but also is providing real, real, um, uh, 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 savings uh, to uh, uh, to the buyer. So let me close on this, and this is a really high level description. And perhaps during the question sessions, um, I'll be able to get into some more detail. One uh, key lessons learned was this was private, a public and private sector relationship. Very key. It could not have happened without the public and private sector working together. In actual fact, uh, underpinning the program as a subsidy was a commitment by government to provide uh, the, the land. Uh, the second bit was integrating the demand and the supply. 
uh, we found that customer confidence was very key. Uh, when people joined the choice clubs, they joined with a clear uh, commitment that if they did their part and saved 20%, they were more or less guaranteed or they had a very reasonable assurance that they were going to get um, a, a home. Uh, the third bit was the capital structure. Um, and one of the key things was how do you make this sustainable? Um, I don't know whether or not uh, that was fully resolved, uh, but the key issue was behind the limited partnership, how do you ensure a sustainable flow of capital that allows the program to be scaled uh, up? Um, it was never really concluded, and I, I suppose this is the downside of all of this. Uh, the product was fully developed, it was piloted, uh, but again, uh, some of the key lessons learned is as whilst you can do all of the technical work, you also have to take account of the political environment. Uh, so at the end of, this, of the first phase, there was a change in government, and the new government decided to do something very different. So in actual fact, beyond a very small initial pilot, uh, uh, the choice program actually never achieved this potential of being scaled up. So because of that, there was some further development that's required at uh, the legal framework, particularly uh, the, 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 um, uh, the tenure uh, of the lease purchaser, whilst they only own a proportion of the homes uh, was unclear. Uh, there were no leg legislative arrangements for ensuring that they were protected in the event that the LP, uh, for example, became uh, insolvent. Finally, I think is the fact that it takes time. Uh, the initial choice clubs, uh, which actually on the pilot project still remain, I involved a significant amount of consumer education for people to understand uh, their, their responsibilities, but also to have the assurance um, around um, uh, the, uh, the commitment of the LP to, have, uh, to ensure that they have their homes. So I will stop there, Olu, and uh, take any questions. Thank you very much. Okay, um, Femi, thank you very much. Um, uh, that was very interesting and very insightful. Um, we, I think we're all into questions at the moment because we need to bring in the other panelists. Um, sorry, can I could then call on uh, Marie to come in and conscious of time, um, Femi decided to hog and take the whole time for <laughs> all the panelists. So we're going to try and uh, move on quickly so that we can have time for questions from the, uh, from the audience. Uh, Marie, do you want to go in? Thank you so much, Olu. Thank you to CAF and Alter for organizing this. Um, yeah, my name is Marie Udil Zanders. I'm head of property partnerships at Empower, and Empower is a new ecosystem investing in affordable and green home loans throughout Africa, um, specifically focused on those now ex excluded from uh, financial systems. And I've also mentioned here, but I usually don't mention it anymore because I've stepped back. I'm a co-founder at Casa Real. The CEO of Casa Real was actually due to speak here. He's really the, the key man on the ground creating all the success of Casa Real. I don't want to claim any of it. It's his work and the team of many Mozambicans in Berra. But unfortunately, Richard was diagnosed with COVID, so uh, and he's not feeling really well. So I'm stepping in from him today, and I'm going to speak mm -hmm. about the title that you've already read, read in the meanwhile. I guess. Please, next slide. Yes, let's. You know, we talk about lease to buy, but let's focus here on reality on the ground. It's using lease to buy as a means to take families from this. Next slide, please. To this, really quality housing that's affordable, that's accessible, that's climate resilient, and last but not least, as much as possible, is also legally registered. And at the end of the day, 
to see if a, if and that's not just for Africa. That's I mean this is this is global. If if a scheme, a financial offering with with a product, in this case, a quality home works on the ground, you need to look at the value propositions. So that's why I've assembled some some key facts here on the project that Empower and Cas Real are working on uh, now in Bera, the, the the test case actually to test Empower's new ecosystem on the ground, um, as starting in Mozambique, where where Cas Real is established. Um, and Cas Real, sorry, I'm trying to be so fast. I'm 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 speeding up maybe too much. Cas Real is uh, Mozambique's leading affordable housing developer, and I'm glad to say also acknowledged by CAF in its yearbook as producing the the second cheapest house in Africa. But if you look at the value proposition on the ground, sometimes people think if people live in literally poor conditions in slums, um, that they probably don't pay a lot. Quite the opposite is true. If you look in Bera, at the slums of Bera, and this situation is not unique to Bera. This is typical to many of the informal settlements throughout Africa, in which 60 plus percent of urban Africa still lives nowadays. But if we now zoom in on a shack in Bera, where it's really, really messy, people literally excuse the word, but literally live in their own shit because there's no infrastructure, it gets flooded with every rain. They still pay 5,000 metical per month. And just to uh, show you how much 5,000 metical is in, in the local economy, 5,000 metical is the minimum salary, official salary for a lower income worker um, per month that they pay for a shack. And on top of that, there's these additional costs mentioned there, these losses. Through Empower's investment into Cas Real, um, Cas Real managed not only to build previously affordable housing, but they, because of the lack of uh, home loan systems that are accessible to the many in Mozambique, there was very little offtake. But through um, the, 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 the scheme now uh, funded by Empower and, and promoted locally by, uh, by Casa Real in, in Bera, Mozambique, they now managed to put it to the market for as low as the lowest in the portfolio, lowest priced home, a small home of 26 square meters, a starter home. They now can put it to the market for 6,650 metikais per month. And if you compare uh, both sides here, that's enormous good value and people are lining up. And I actually, um, you know, if, if the offer is good, people will come to you. Casleal doesn't have to do any marketing. People are lining up. Next slide, please. So I've already mentioned, um, Empower has just started. Casleal has just only, this is really, hot from the ground, has only just launched a few months ago a larger scale uh, lease to buy scheme. Uh, this is just still a test, I would say, because the ambitions are way bigger than this, but um, Casreal launched lease to buy um, and, and Empower refinanced certain homes to enable this lease to buy program uh, with an investment with a 10 years term. And now roughly 45 people are on the lease to buy contract. You can see here the range of jobs of these clients and, and other features. And I would say the most important thing I want to share with this audience is that people who on paper are very poor, and I'm not saying that poverty does not exist. Poverty is there, and especially in a poor country such as Mozambique. But if you find a way to enable people to not only put in their formally registered income, which is usually the case with mortgages, it only enables put people to put in that, that payment they can uh, give paperwork for. But if you allow them, uh, motivate them to also put in their informal income as, an, as a family, if you allow them also to, from their family and other networks, also to bring in um, um, financial flows, the situation changes. And what we see now already on the ground is that not only are people paying their leases on time, but they're actually also building up equity. 
and more than one would expect from them. Please go to the next slide. So this means as, as um, registered by the research of CAF in their um, the housing finance yearbook, based on the current formal mortgage system, only 3% of Mozambicans could access Casareal's cheapest house, the $10,000 house, which is cheap, but it's still not accessible. And that's because the mortgage system just doesn't work. This number shows it. Six, roughly 600 mortgages are out there in Mozambique, in a country of 30 million people. How, how much more proof do you want that the systems do not work? And it does not work because mortgage systems are so exclusive to those for whom the system works. It works if you have a formal income. Um, and PAWAS and its delivery partners schemes work because it's forward looking. People can pay a minimum amount and then while they pay the lease, save equity. There's not much more time to talk now. I want to leave really the room to questions. If you have any, and I want to focus also on the least to buy experience on the ground and if possible through questions and answers, explain more on that. If you want to know more about the Empower Investment Scheme, please visit the Empower website or contact me. And um, I'll leave it to here for now so we can move to questions. Um, uh, thanks, Marie. Um... I had the privilege of visiting your project yesterday, and, um, and it's a testament to what you said about the um, ability of people operating in the informal sector to be able to um, develop and expand their own homes. And I saw evidence of how people within a very short period of time, with the benefit of the list to uh, own um, scheme, able to extend, and in some cases, also uh, build upwards. So, so really, it, it was quite um, exciting to, to, to visit your project yesterday and well done. So I call on Maya, Maya now to explain and also present the exciting project that it's working on in South Africa, which um, I had the pleasure of um, talking to you some weeks ago about it. So, so really looking forward to your presentation. Maya. Good afternoon and thank you very much. Yeah, just as an introduction from myself, I'm a property lawyer in Cape Town and um, dating back, back many, many years ago when we started to rent to buy concept, it was quite uh, interesting in those days because when I started that, it was in the high days of the National Credit Act that came into play. And I actually thought, ah, some, somebody in South Africa is already doing it. And I started research and I saw there's no rent to buy structure in South Africa. So I'm an attorney by trade. And in 2007, we saw that the market went through a big slump when the National Credit Act hit the industry, 2006, 2007. And we started about the concept of how can I rent a property and pay it off? And interesting enough, in 1980, which is a long time ago, I bought my first television on a rent to own concept because I was not so clever on tuning the TV in every time it went out of focus and I rented it out with a service plan. But then we saw that soon after people started approaching us for rent to buy, that they have got big credit problems and big problems, small problems, but the banks do not accept them on approving the uh, for, uh, applications for a loan and therefore declining. So we started the My Budget Fitness Program. And then I started looking, where can we get money for first-time buyers? And I saw in the South African market that we have subsidies for first-time buyers called FLISP, F-L-I-S-P, and it stands for Finance Linked Individual Subsidy Program. Subsequently, we signed a partnership with LexisNexis and also the National Housing Finance Corporation. We realized that first-time buyers in South Africa is about 55% of, of buyers, and we started with education, and today still our biggest client is African Bank, and we're educating and assisting their staff members how to get around to buy a house. Then we realized that to scale applications, we can't do it on the back of a cigarette box, and we developed an online pre-qualification system. At the moment, one of the biggest bond originators are using my software, and they're pushing up to between nine to 10,000 subscribers per month, and there we can filter the buyers from credit score and affordability. 
We also started a service as attorneys providing buyer assistance. And we are 14 firms of attorneys on a national scale. We introduced rent to buy finance as well. And I want to unpack for you how it came about and the different services. And this is an extract from the online subscribers. There you can see between nine to 10,000 people per month sign up trying to buy a house and first checking out online their credit score. This is software that we developed. But you'll see that about 50% of these applications are flat straight from the word go declined because of a bad, bad credit score. And we see that in the current market still in South Africa, and I think globally, only the tip of the iceberg that sticks out are able to raise finance. And we said, why don't we change this around with budget and debt repair? And let's turn that pyramid around that we actually start assisting those with bad or low or thin or no credit scores through education, consumer education, engaging with them, assisting them, and that eventually they will start to push down and they will become green scores where they can actually um, apply for a home loan and be successful. But in between, there needs to be a mechanism in between. And this is where we found rent to buy such a fantastic um, solution and opportunity. In South Africa, we are very lucky that we've got FLISP finance linked individual subsidy programs. And this has been a game changer in the industry. Um, to qualify, you must be a first time buyer, your finance must be approved, you must not, you must earn between 3,501 up to 22. If you in South Africa earn under 3,500, you can qualify for a free house, but you have to stand in a very long queue. You must have a financial dependent and you must be a South African citizen. And from the 1st of April, the government decided to fill the gap between the gap. And they made the subsidy not only linked to a home loan anymore, but also from a provident fund, a pension fund, cooperative stock fails, employees, uh, government housing is, um, employee schemes, unsecured loans, and music to my ears, also to rent, to own, and installment sales. So this was for me a huge game changer because all of a sudden now we can use a FLIS subsidy as a deposit when you buy a property, even on FLIS and installment sales. So I was very cheeky about five, years, five or six years ago, and I registered the domain flisp.co.za. First, the government came out and had a huge fight with me, but I can try to hijack the website or plan or whatever. But I said to them, if you don't do the assistance and service to buyers, I'm going to do that. And today we are actually in partnership with the National Housing Finance Corporation, one of the biggest implementation agencies. And we also rolled out the rent to buy and the FLISP subsidy program for the government, which I will show to you now. So we developed an online calculator called the FLISP subsidy calculator. You can type in your income and it kicks out for your subsidy. And this is an amazing subsidy and you'll see how it benefits on the rent to buy structure. So we even helped a lady that earns about four and a half thousand rand at the age of 58 to buy a first house because it was a combination between FLISP and also a home loan. And then, obviously, one needs technology, as I mentioned to you, and to develop that technology that a buyer can sign up online, they can do the ID verification, they can link up their credit score, they can link up bank accounts, or they can upload a bank statement, confirm the budget, and then they get a certificate. So we developed this for one of the biggest bond originators. And these certificates are issued electronically, but we also combine it with a rent to buy algorithms for a per property purchase. Then we also link it up with a FLISP smart voucher that you have two certificates in your pocket. One is for your home loan or for your rent to buy affordability. And the other one is for your FLISP subsidy. This combination helps you to buy a property. And I'll show you now how it fits into the rent to buy concept. So the rent to buy process flow, people need to understand how it works. We understand that it's a first time buyer. They don't have any idea how the process, how it works. And if we give him a, a, a visual explanation how it works, we pre-qualify them. We have a schedule appointment with a consultant. We discuss the budget. We inform about insurance because this is such an important part of a buyer's journey. You can't just assume that they understand the process, how to go through. We take their hand, we prepare the legal documents, not going to go through the entire slide. But at the end of the day, you have an opportunity to rent the property with an opportunity to buy. All the legal documents are part of a, of a stack of the legal documents and presented to the client and explained to them how it works. So 
we actually when went out and looked at alternative ways of bringing rent to buy to the market. And one of the most amazing opportunities that we have is a private fund that provides finance in the price range of 400,000 Rand to 2.9 million Rand. Western Cape, Gauteng, um, Port Elizabeth, East London, and Durban. And we also pre-qualify the buyer and there they can actually, the fund will buy the property on behalf of a client. The fund will then own the property for a period of 15 years. And this is associated with an installment sale agreement, which is very close to rent to buy. The nice thing about FLISP is that FLISP actually triggers or the installment sale transaction triggers the FLISP payout and you can use the FLISP subsidy as your deposit because this fund requires a 5% deposit. And quite often through the FLISP subsidy that we can obtain from the government, we can actually get 8% or 9% deposit, which again improves the loan to value, which in, uh, again improves the negotiation in respect of interest rate discussion. Then, through the years, you can see we've done rent to buy since 2007, and we had so many individual transactions, and I've just packaged here a few more corporate or bigger transactions. One of them is where uh, we received an invite from the Government Employment uh, Pension Fund from Namibia, where we packaged um, a product for them where they split 500 Namibian dollars into a home loan package and 250 into rent to buy. At the end of the day, after going through all the calculations and presentations, they decided to move all the money over to a home loan product. But by that time, they understand how the rent to buy functions and hopefully we'll uh, kickstart that in the future. Because we discussed last night as well, sometimes there are failures. I don't see this as a failure. I see this as another project, which hopefully the Namibian, Namibian government will maybe one day implement. So here we're looking at the case study of a hotel group that came to us. They own a large number of um, hotel rooms and they were able to actually hold onto the properties for a period of 15 years. We then packaged all the legal documents. We prepared a payment structure and the, we would pre-screen a, a potential buyer as well. And we would then work out a spreadsheet how the repayment will happen over a period of 15 years. So this was a prime example. We have an existing landowner that's owned the property for a long time, and they decided they want to introduce ownership and make ownership available. Then um, a company called Communicare also made contact with us. They have been in existence since um, 1927. So that's almost 100 years old. And they also came to us with a lot of um, stock where their tenants have been renting for a long time. And we realized again there that although we are very much a technology company with our services and products, but a lot of the um, tenants there are not tech, tech savvy. And although we developed very nice onboarding uh, platforms for them, we had to revert back, as you can see in the bottom, a home finance calculator where we would literally hand out a manual printed document. They would complete the information. From there, we would then go through our onboarding process and protocol. And once they had been screened and approved, we would then onboard them. So the, I think the exciting part for me is that because we've been doing rent to buy for such a long time, we are really have gone through a lot of... Uh, information and be able to package it. Then we're looking at Mill Park. This is a combination of the government in South Africa giving 15 million Rand and then adding another 10 million Rand to the um, municipality of Bredarsdorp. And we package for them a rent to buy concept, which is very unique. 50% of a rental for a period of two years will be put in a savings account. And during that time, you will have an opportunity to rent with an option to buy. And here is a typical example of a client where we um, analyze the client's profile, the affordability, going through salaries, application process, and eventually get a very, very comprehensive analysis of a client's information. Then we provide the client with a certificate, which they sign and accept. Immediately, we assign a personal trainer because this personal trainer walks for walk for the next 24 months and longer to assist you to get pre-qualified, to stay budget fit. The client then decides on a house. Here you can see a house of 467,000 Rand of 43 square meters. Now, the beautiful part of this is that the person rents for a period of two years. 50% of the rental goes into the savings account. At the end of a rent to buy, they ought to qualify for a government FLISP subsidy, and then they have a double deposit to deduct. So there we worked out that 
the income range of a person can all of a sudden change because there's double deduction of a deposit. And you can see that in this case, a person will save about 850 Rand per month on a 460,000 Rand house. Some of our buyers are able to save a thousand Rand on a 460,000 Rand house. That's almost 20% of their home loan amount that they save. Here we've done another calculation for the municipality because obviously they have a certain amount of funds and we don't want to deplete those funds. We want to roll it over and that after two years, they'll get their money back in the form of 50% of a rental, which they can add back to the capital and then they can develop further properties again. So this is a rent to buy team. Um, and I think I've run out of my time. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And this is very much a high level discussion. Olu, thanks a lot. I didn't even go through the protocols to <laughs> thank everybody, but thanks for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Okay, thank you, man. I, I mean, quite, I mean, obviously, the, I'm hoping that the passion and the commitment to the product is coming out from all the presentations um, we've received. And apologies, um, uh, because we've got limited time to take questions. I'll probably take one of the big questions that is, um, I, I will um, uh, um, ask all our uh, panelists to give a very short response to. So we all, you all have demonstrated that this product is relevant, it's important, there's a market for it. How come, what can we do to scale it up? Because ultimately we're proposing that this is an alternative to a mortgage product, but taking into account the, the demand and the needs out there, how can we scale it up? and make it attractive to institutional investors. And I see that there's some colleagues from IFC on the line as well. These are the sort of institutions ultimately that should be investing in this type of product. How can we make it attractive to them? Um, so if I start with Marie, then I'll go to Mayor, then I'll go to Femi. Thank you, Olu. And yes, indeed, this needs to scale. Otherwise, you know, nothing's gonna change. In, uh, in urban Africa. Um, and I would say, and Olu, you probably guess what I was gonna say to this one because, because you know a little bit about Empower already. I would say we need to acknowledge that the current systems don't work and that the current banking tools are not working for the majority. If 70% of Africans are on informal incomes, how is a very formal and bureaucratic system then going to benefit them? So I would say my message is to institutional investors, explore the opportunities that the current new tools uh, powered by blockchains and, and further associated functionalities from that uh, scene can make system works work for everyone. Uh, work as well for Shepard in Senegal as, as for Bill Gates. And there's a lot, I'm just going to throw in one term here that if you don't know, you can look it up. Use, use the technologies of Web3, which can help give those informal an identity, be more efficient and affordable in transforming value and set up a new government system to finally unlock this space for which there's so much pent-up demand locally. Thank you, Marie. Uh, Mayor, do you, do you have any thought? I mean, you, you're operating in much more, I suppose, within the context of our development housing financial system. Um, it would be interesting to see what is the level of interest from institutional, institutional investors and what needs to be done to attract more players into the marketplace. Obviously, return on investment and the models that we worked out actually gives a very solid return on investment. It also provides a return on the capital because nobody wants to pump in money and never see the money again. So the models that we worked out does return, give a provide a good return on investment, plus it returns the capital back to the investors after a year or two or three. But I think the best what we've learned from here is that the amazing platform that, uh, thank you very much for Olu and for Kisha and the team, that I think we must do meet on a regular basis and form a panel. Everybody must join in because collectively we can actually just build something very strong. If we all try to do our own thing, 
is going to happen. But if we all stand together, for me, this is the exciting part that we learn from each other, collectively we build and expand the concept, and then we want to have a very solid platform. So thank you very much for the opportunity. We hope we're going to expand this onto a regular uh, group for, for, for taking this further. Really exciting. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mary. I'm going to squeeze in very quickly just to say that's the AUHF. That's what we do. Oh. So I, I, I was going to back that up. So I'm, <laughs> okay, I'm, ally I'm, I'm aligned as well. And so that's actually what the AUHF does. And it's an opportunity also, a challenge for the AUHF to find a way in which we're going to get this going because we shouldn't allow this to stop there. So, can you come in? Uh, no, no, I think very briefly, I totally agree with Marie. I think that, look, uh, doing the same thing and expecting a different result is absolute madness. Uh, so we need to keep looking at different ways uh, of doing this. I think what we do know is the fact that um, uh, this product, and, and you know, for a start, we actually need to define what it means. There's lease purchase, there's um, rent to own, there's buy to home, which is confusing for professionals, never mind um, uh, the, the average um, uh, guys out there on the street. So actually we've got to define what exactly the product is. Currently, you know, it's, it's a little bit uncertain. Um, but even given that, um, certainly my experience has been that uh, it's something that has a significant potential for scaling up. Uh, so if you take the family homes funds, we had about 3,000 homes for sale. Uh, the initial strategy was to try to sell them via mortgages. But once we, once we switched to something that was close uh, to, to a lease purchase, um, uh, up to two thirds of the current commitments are based on that model. People suddenly found that it, it gave them improved access uh, to, to home ownership. So I think first we need to tidy up what the product, what the product is. Uh, secondly, I think that we need to have a product that is transparent and, and blockchain does that. Um, and thirdly, it's something that is attractive uh, to the capital market. Uh, scaling up means more capital and where more capital is, is in the capital markets. Thank you. Thank you, because I'm going to invite um, Kesha to sort of wrap it up because I'm conscious of time. Uh, but Femi, I know there's a question on the line. Um, somebody has asked about how realistic is to develop least to own you know, expensive cities like um, um, Lagos. Um, well, no doubt, if you don't mind dropping the individual an email because um, I need to wrap this up. But can I just say from Altair, thank you for the AUHF for giving us the platform to ignite this um, subject or to bring it to the platform. Um, we as an organization are looking forward to continue this sort of partnership with the AUHF and some of our other clients in Africa and Asia. But it's been personally from my point of view, a very enjoyable um, uh, process or opportunity to share our expertise with um, colleagues um, across the globe. Um, Kesia, can I now hand it over for you to, to wrap it up and hopefully we all meet again in Cairo and greetings from Beira. Fantastic, thank you so much, Olu. Um, this has been a really great series and thank you to you and your team and your network um, for, for really um, contributing and making this as rich as it has been over, over the past four sessions. Thank you to this panel. Um, it's been so interesting. And, and I was writing furiously. I was getting WhatsApps from other people who were listening saying, we need to learn more about this. We're going to be in touch with you about writing it down um, as a series of case studies or something, because I think it's, it's really such valuable information that you've shared. And this kind of sharing is really, really important. Um, I'm sorry that we ran out of time from a question perspective. An hour is a very short amount of time. Um, and I'd really like to take Mayor up on, on his suggestion that we carry these conversations forward. So you've seen my comment in the chat. 
Um, please, if you have particular issues within the context of this series around rent to own that you'd like to discuss, send those through. If you have other threads of conversation that you'd like us to facilitate, this really is something that the AUHF would like to do both virtually through this forum and then also at our annual conference. And then we were in Namibia on Monday. That was the day before yesterday, um, talking there about Namibia's housing policy. And we did meet with, with colleagues who were looking at rent to own as well. Um, so we work both virtually and in person in real life. Um, and we really wanna carry forward relevant conversations that catch your interest. Um, and that encourage you to all participate and bring your expertise into the conversation. So please don't be shy. Um, contact us. Um, I've put Tandiwe's uh, email address in the chat, but I'm sure you have it already. Probably have mine too. Just write to us and we'll do our best to keep the conversation going. Please do put into your calendars to come to Cairo, um, end of November. Lovely time of year for, for a visit and some really stimulating discussions around a green urban future for affordable housing. Thank you, everybody, and have a great afternoon. Bye-bye.